Testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
You, Chris? You want to, this, we're getting, you want to test it? Okay, you good? Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, okay. But this is, level's good?
Good morning. Welcome to the Republican majority in the 118th Congress. House Republicans are hitting the ground running and we are laser focused on passing our commitment to America agenda and much needed critical oversight of the Biden administration. Yesterday, we passed the most member driven and transparent rules package in history and finally ended Democrats authoritarian reign on our nation's capital we restored and fully opened the People's House. Our first orders of legislative business have been exactly what we promised to the American people. We promised on day one to repeal Joe Biden's army of 87,000 new IRS agents, and yesterday we did just that. Today, we will counter the Chinese Communist Party with our Select Committee on China. We will vote to protect every American's constitutional rights with the new Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. We will also vote to stop the Biden administration from selling our strategic petroleum reserves to China. And of course, this week, as thousands prepare to stand for life in our nation's capital next week, we will continue to hold the line and protect the most vulnerable among us by bringing the Born Alive Survivors Protection Bill to the floor. And we are just getting started. House Republicans are unified and united in our effort to implement our commitment to America to save this country. And it's my honor to turn it over to my colleague, Michael Cloud from Texas. 
The big note of the week is that the People's House is open for business, and I can tell you it's been awesome to see in the last week, even as we roam the halls, to see families coming together and once able, one, once again able to, to tour the People's House. Well, this rules package was along those lines in opening up the People's House for business. This is, as the Chairwoman said, the most, most member-driven process on the Rules Committee. This was always about the needed reforms and structures that needed to happen in Congress. Many of us and most of us ran with the understanding that Congress is broken. A lot of those issues predated all of us, but it was really be beholden upon us to do something about it. And so what we saw last week is members coming together, working together to make this a member-driven body where members would be able to adequately have input on bills, where we'd be able to, to honestly debate these sorts of things and come together. And I can tell you, I could not be more proud of our conference coming together, working together through these issues and giving us a Congress not the kind of top-down Congress we see from the left where it, they talk about unity, but it's conformity. It's really made for TV government. This is the kind of government that's made for the people, where we have honest, deliberative input among the people elected to represent them. We come to a, an awesome, sex, successful conclusion, and we're ready to work for the people. Last night's bill was a great example of that. We're going to see a lot of progress going forward and uh, could not be more excited about where this conference is at this point. God bless you all. We will now hear from the gentleman from Nebraska, Adrian Smith, who was the lead on the bill to repeal the IRS agent. Thank you, Elise, and thank you to the entire team here. Uh, last night's legislation is about taxpayers. Uh, it's about empowering taxpayers who are trying to just do the right thing in, in paying their taxes uh, without having to face <clears throat> more and more IS, IRS resources, I think, randomly uh, out, uh, out to place all these audits across the economy. <clears throat> without being as diligent and customer service oriented as they should be. And I, I told my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, let's work together to address the customer service needs that are absolutely needed uh, all, all across uh, the IRS, uh, because there, there are problems, uh, clearly. That, there's bipartisan agreement that there, there are problems at the IRS. So the first step is to draw back uh, these, these dollars that I think were so randomly placed uh, and then start over so that we can meet the needs of, of taxpayers and the American people uh, all across uh, America. So next uh, up is Anthony D'Esposito, uh, uh, featuring uh, a freshman. Great to have uh, an expanded team here. And uh, he flipped a seat in New York, and we're glad he's on the team. Well, thank you, and, and good morning. It's great to be here uh, with everyone. And most important, during the campaign, we make promises. And what's nice to hear today from our leadership is those promises that we made, we are gonna keep. And I am excited as a retired New York City detective, as someone who has spent his entire adult life in the public safety world, I'm excited that our leadership has put the protection of law enforcement at the forefront. As Democrats and the far radicals wage war, especially in New York, against those who wear the uniform, I'm honored to be part of a group a group that stands with the men and women who protect and serve, a group that stands to protect us and make sure that we hold accountable those who take oaths to prosecute and protect us. And I'm excited and look forward to the coming weeks and the 118th Congress where we will put forth our commitment to America and continue to protect the United States of America and the men and women who serve it. Thank you. Now we'll turn it over to our Majority Whip, Tom Emmer. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I, I guess uh, I'm going to dovetail in where, uh, where Michael Cloud started. I, last week was historic. I, you know, most of those deals usually take place uh, behind closed doors, long before uh, anybody gets to see how the sausage is really made. We'll remember that Nancy Pelosi uh, gave all kinds of things two years ago just to uh, uh, stay uh, by the slimmest of margins. Uh, as the speaker. Kevin McCarthy, on the other hand, uh, in our conference last week, what you saw was uh, democracy at work. What you saw were people, as Michael said, representing their districts, coming to Washington, D.C., sitting down with each other in spite of differences, in spite of different perspectives, uh, and being able to ultimately, ultimately hammer out an agreement where they can work together. And it was misreported, I believe, yesterday uh, that uh, all of this was one thing. Uh, the rules package last night was very basic. 
uh, with the exception of some uh, church language, I think our leader said, uh, there really were no changes. These were voted on before, uh, that and the motion to vacate that went from five members down to one. Uh, the other agreement is an agreement that the entire conference is going to hold themselves to and their leadership. Uh, it has to do with single subject matter bills. It has to do with uh, eliminating Christmas trees, and I think Morgan Griffith said it best. Uh, we're not going to see any longer if we enforce uh, these uh, uh, agreements amongst ourselves. We're not going to see where the House sends over a coin bill to the Senate, which uh, is a ceremonial uh, type uh, piece of legislation, which they sit on and then ultimately they strip it and they fill it with, uh, I believe it was the Inflation Reduction Act, and they send it back uh, is uh, the coin bill. Uh, that will no longer uh, be acceptable in the House, uh, which I, I would argue, I, and I, I think we heard this from one of our members this morning in conference, Morgan Griffith, uh, this will arguably not make Kevin McCarthy a weaker speaker. This will make Kevin McCarthy perhaps the strongest speaker in modern times, uh, this agreement. And there'll be more on that to come. The good news for us, the people that are standing up here, is we started to become a team last week. There's 222. Uh, this is a great time to be a Republican in Washington, D.C., in the House, because you have a chance to make a difference, and you have a chance to be part of a great team that is going to work together. And I, I think you saw that starting to happen last week. Uh, have we arrived? No. No, not yet. Uh, we'll continue to get better at this together. Uh, and sadly for all of you in this room, uh, the better we get, the more boring we're going to be. So thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you to our whip. Uh, good morning to all of you, and it is exciting to be here as part of the new Republican House majority. Uh, we've already started to get to work. You saw last night we passed the rules package. I know uh, a number of, of members of the press were asking me yesterday morning even, you know, are you going to pass the rules package? And we said, of course we are, because the rules package is a culmination of member meetings negotiations that have been going on for months, frankly. And then you saw last week there were a lot of conversations about changing the way that Washington works. And that's really at the heart of what the rules changes addressed last night that passed ultimately overwhelmingly by our members because Washington has been broken. I don't think you have to do a poll to know people across the country have recognized that Washington's broken. Washington just has not been working for the families, the millions of hardworking people across this country who are struggling under the weight of all the reckless policies passed, signed into law by Joe Biden, passed by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer uh, for two years, where you've seen devastating inflation as a result of their reckless spending. You've seen incredibly high costs at the grocery store, everything you buy because of the reckless decisions made in Washington, energy costs through the roof because of the reckless decisions made in Washington. An open border that has not only led to millions of people coming into our country illegally. Last year alone, uh, the, the number of people that came here illegally are more than the people in the state of New Mexico. That's how many people came in illegally just last year. The fentanyl deaths, more than 100,000 of our young people died last year because of the fentanyl coming across our southern border. And what was Washington doing to address those problems? Not a thing. And in fact, they shut out the ability for members like us who wanted to solve these problems on behalf of the 750,000 plus people we represent. And so we knew that needed to change. In fact, that's one of the reasons we won the majority. And we ran on a platform of changing Washington. And that started last week. And you saw that debate. And it was a healthy debate. Frankly, it was a debate that needed to happen years ago. And so once we got through that, we had to formalize it in the rules package, and we did. And then we went to work. And the first thing we did is delivering on the promises that we made during the campaign. We made a commitment to America. We said the first bill we're going to take up is the bill to repeal those 87,000 IRS agents. And Adrian Smith is now, you have the, uh, the, the plaque? So he's got the plaque. Uh, with the result of the vote, 221 votes yesterday, every Republican voted for it, every Democrat voted against it. And think about this. Yesterday, every Democrat won on record saying that they want to more than double the size of the IRS age, uh, of the IRS to go after people like the hardworking families, the, the single mom who's working two shifts at a restaurant. Uh, the CBO confirmed that when they added those IRS agents, it wasn't just to go after the millionaires and billionaires. It was to go after people making less than $200,000 a year. Broke President Biden's pledge. We actually had an amendment 
when that bill was going through to say that the new IRS agents couldn't go after people making less than $400,000 to hold President Biden to his own pledge. Do you know every Democrat voted against that amendment? And so those IRS agents would be set up to go after hardworking families across this country. Frankly, what we need is more Border Patrol agents securing America's border, not IRS agents going after hardworking families in America. And so we passed that bill. And we're going to pass more good bills this week. You're going to see us today set up the Select Subcommittee on China to finally confront the challenge that is one of the greatest threats to our nation. Uh, and that is what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing. Uh, all around the globe, uh, making challenges to our country and other countries around the world. Uh, we're going to set up that church committee to look at some of these federal agencies that are weaponizing government to go after families across this country based on their political views. That's not what government should be doing. We're going to be looking into that as well. We're going to pass the Born Alive Act. This is a bill we talked about a long time. In fact, every Republican was a co-sponsor of this bill last Congress, and Nancy Pelosi wouldn't bring it up to a vote. And in our first full week, we're going to actually bring that bill up for a vote. Ann Wagner's bill that says if a baby's born alive outside the womb, in some states they actually are allowing that baby to be killed and calling it abortion. It's murder, and yet it's legal in some states. Even people that identify as pro-choice think that that's disgusting and immoral and shouldn't be allowed in America, and yet it is. And so we're going to confront that, too. And then we're going to set up our committees. You saw yesterday we finished out the chairmanships. We're going to start populating the committees. And then the committees are going to get to work, bringing bills out that will actually address inflation, allow us to lower costs for families, fighting for those families who have had nobody fighting for them in Washington for years, for way too long. Washington has needed to change. And last week we started that process. Last night we culminated it with the rules package. And now we get to work implementing it. And that's ultimately what matters, is getting the job done for those families who are struggling all across this country. And we're excited and we're up to the challenge. We're ready to get to work. With that, we'd be happy to take your questions. You. Yes. Well, you saw him seated last week. There were no challenges to that. This is something that's being handled internally. Obviously, there were concerns about uh, what we had heard, and so we're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it, and that's something that we're going to deal with, uh, just like there's a lot of other things we're going to deal with. But do you think and, and Mike, well, I have a second question for Congressman Tom. Um, you were in the negotiations last week. There's a lot of conversation around whether or not there's this three-page addendum, these other <laughs> negotiations and deals that were made with Freedom Caucus members. Can you confirm, like, is there an addendum? Is this an official piece of paper, or is this just a word-of-mouth agreement? There's, uh, there's no addendum. Uh, I wouldn't call it an addendum. I think our speaker put it up on the screen today and showed people. It uh, reinstitutes the Holman rule. It eliminates the Gephardt rule. Uh, there will be single subject matter uh, uh, bills. There will be uh, germaneness uh, issues are going to be important. Uh, he made it very clear that there were no uh, uh, gavels given out. There were no deals like that that were made. This is, uh, I, I think it's more than just aspirational. I think it literally is something that the entire conference is going to want to hold ourselves to and, frankly, hold our uh, partners on the other side of the building to. Uh, but I wouldn't call it an addendum because that was the confusion yesterday. We were voting on a rules package that literally had some minor uh, wording changes in the church language and then had the motion to vacate number changed. This uh, discussion is about something totally separate. And in fact, uh, somebody from downtown, I understand, was circulating a document saying, this is the addendum that you're voting. Well, no, that's something totally separate. And I think uh, the majority leader can certainly comment on it. So can Michael, that uh, I think the uh, speaker literally put a, a, uh, a screen up today showing everybody what's in it. Why not release to the public all these deals that were reached, the, this, this screenshot that was shown in conference? You guys talk about transparency. Isn't it essential for the American public to understand exactly what deals were cut in order for them to make the decision? Well, the, the, the speaker talked about that today, and, and some of the things involved making sure that our committees are represented by a full swath of our membership. It wasn't any person was committed a committee, but look, we've got a lot of different 
groups within our conference. The Democrats do as well, by the way. And we want to make sure, and this is something the steering committee is going to take up. Uh, so again, it wasn't like this person's allowed that spot on a committee. The steering committee is going to make that decision. But if we're going to be able to do our business, I'd love for the Democrats to vote with us. For example, this week, we're going to have a bill to say if the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is rated like President Biden has rated it over and over again, taking over 40 percent of our nation's reserve away, not to fix a national emergency, but to mask his really bad anti-American energy policies, then it shouldn't be sold to China. I hope every Democrat votes with us to say that America's national reserve for oil shouldn't be sold to China, like President Biden did recently. Uh, but if Democrats don't work with us to solve these problems, we're going to still do it on our own. And so that means the committees have to produce bills that come out of committee that represent the full swath of our conference. And so that's, the, that's something the steering committee is going to take up. And those decisions, but those, let's recognize, those decisions haven't been finalized yet because the steering committee, starting tomorrow, will go in to take up all of the committee's slots that have to be filled. The ratios have to be finalized. And then ultimately, uh, you know, what bills come to the floor, those are decisions through regular order that are going to be established. You know, we'll have a term limits bill that we're going to bring to the floor, but it was clear it's got to go through regular order. Uh, which means we're going to have committees in person again. By the way, last night, not only did we get rid of proxy voting, we got rid of virtual hearings in committees. So committees can't be meeting in these Brady Box style boxes where nobody's in a room and everybody's in some remote location and you can't even discuss an amendment. We're going to be back in person again and we're going to be having field hearings. Uh, we're going to have uh, the Judiciary Committee having a hearing on this open border at the border. We can actually go have that hearing at the place where the problem is happening. That's going to be exciting for people to see. Yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, nobody has been assigned to uh, any of those committees yet. But as we see what comes out, the Democrats set a precedent that we urge them strongly not to go uh, down last Congress. They decided that they were going to break the, the precedent that had been in place over 200 years and remove members of the opposing party that our party selected to be on committees. And so that was a practice they set. And so obviously we're going to be looking very closely at who they appoint. They hadn't appointed anybody yet two committees, but we're going to see if they do. What has been agreed to on the debt ceiling that specifically the Christopher Bond Fusion Group? How do you guarantee the Republican Green Lodge can get all that money back? Well, let, let's first make very clear why the debt ceiling gets hit. And I think this is an important education process to have now and an important conversation to have now because we haven't hit the debt ceiling yet. But America, over time, occasionally hits the debt ceiling because it's like a credit card limit. And families back home, have, if they have credit cards, they have a limit on that credit card. And if they hit their limit or they're very close to it, which we are, it means you've spent more money than you have. You've, you've spent more money than you, your credit card has allowed you to spend. And if you're going to ask for an increase in the limit, at some point in time, you've got to sit down and say, why are we hitting the limit? Why are we maxing out the credit card? Because uh, this is the nation's credit card. And frankly, it's not us, but next generations that are going to have to pay this. Debt is not something that's just in, innocuous. It's going to ultimately have to pay, be paid by somebody, and that's future generations. And so if the country is spending more money than we have, and it's trillions of dollars, by the way, and Joe Biden, you saw uh, trillions and trillions of dollars in bills to rack up debt, that ultimately somebody's going to have to pay. There is no free lunch. And so if we're about to max out the credit card, then before we hit that limit, shouldn't we have an honest conversation about how to start living within our means, how to make sure we're not spending money that we don't have before that comes up? And when that comes up, at the same time you're dealing with the debt limit, you ought to also put in mechanisms in place so that you don't keep maxing it out. Because if the limit gets raised, you don't go to the store the next day and just max it out again. You start figuring out how to control the spending problem. And this has been going on for way too long, and we're going to confront this, and I think the American people have called on us to confront this problem. Yes, back in the back. We're going to go in the back. Yeah. No, and in fact, we haven't talked about reducing defense spending. We've talked about 
bringing accountability to government. A government has needed accountability for a long time, and we've seen none of that over the last two years. You know, whether it's the origins of COVID, where everybody in America has asked that question at some point in time. You know, we were told it was, you know, some bat biting a cat, and the cat bit some guy in the wet market in Wuhan. Uh, and now scientists are looking at it saying that's probably not what, ha what happened. It's probably a genetically manipulated disease that was probably manipulated in the lab in Wuhan, and yet Democrats refuse to let us even talk about that over the last two years. We're going to be investigating things like that. We're going to talk about accountability on spending in every federal agency. And if agencies or if there's waste, fraud, and abuse in any agency, it's got to be rooted out. And so that's what we've been talking about, is how to aggressively root out waste, fraud, and abuse with taxpayer dollars. And it started with the IRS bill last night that Adrian passed. Right over here. We're welcome to you next. Wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Speaker, Speaker McCarthy laid that out today to the membership. And again, there's still some decisions that have to be made, like the steering committee uh, will be meeting to fill out the rest of the committees. Uh, that hasn't been decided yet. Uh, we don't even know which members are going to go for which committees in some of those cases. But at the end of the day, we want our committees to reflect our conference if we want to get bills out to the floor uh, to pass, because as the whip knows, you don't want to wait until a bill's on the floor to recognize that there might be an issue. You take care of those issues in committee, and that's why you want the entire conference represented, the different groups in, within our conference represented on the various committees, and we're going to be working and to do that Steve, right here. Steve, Steve, oh, I find it hard to you believe. You want to come in a... No, no. I find it hard to believe that you all don't have a copy of the screenshot already. <laughs> that's, we usually hear about that. We'll go here, and then we'll go to chats. Well, first of all, do we really know that for years, when Vice President Biden left office, it looks like he took classified documents with him. And he was very critical of President Trump. By the way, the only person that has the constitutional ability to declassify any documents is the president of the United States, not the vice president. So if then Vice President Biden took classified documents with him and held them for years and criticized President, former President Trump, during that same time that he had those classified documents, and only after it was uncovered did he turn them back. I wonder why the press isn't asking the same questions of him as vice president taking classified documents that they were asking President Trump. Well, actually, the Justice Department would indicate these are what, about, what about the, the, you know, looking at that whole document and, and the series of those years, why should we not think that almost every one of these big policy issues that you're bringing here is going to be right on the edge, three or four votes, all the drama, whether it be cutting spending, even the abortion bill, some of these things are very controversial. Why is that path not clear out for the rest of the next eight years? Well, with a five-seat majority, if, if you have a few people that are, that are absent because they're family issues back home, you know, we saw that. Some members had to get back home to a, to a loved one that had a health that issue. And that, and that ultimately is something, look, nobody said any, any of this is going to be easy. Fixing the problems of the country is complicated because they're huge problems. These aren't small problems that our country is facing. The good news is we've got a majority that all, from various philosophies, people from different walks of life, all came here to help solve problems. And these are big problems. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take committees doing a lot of work to ultimately get the policy right. What's important is not the margin of the vote, but making sure we get the policies right to fight for those hardworking families who have been left behind by Washington for far too long. And it's going to be an exciting process to watch. I think people are going to be tuned in like they were last week. Look forward to talking to you soon.
Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with three of our ranking members and our distinguished vice chair at this press conference. House Democrats are ready in the 118th Congress. We stand united behind Hakeem Jeffries, whose leadership is astounding, bold, courageous, decisive. You get the, you get the point. The chaos and crisis on the other side of the aisle has not stopped House Republicans. After caving to demands from extremists in their conference, Speaker McCarthy has a secret three-page list of promises that will prevent his caucus uh, from, that he had to put in place to prevent his caucus from voting down their own rules package. Rather than trying to find common ground, House Republicans have chosen a path of division and default. We've not seen a single concrete proposal from Republican leadership that will lower costs for everyday Americans. Instead, they've ratcheted up their attacks on women's reproductive rights, against voting rights legislation, and, to cod and against codifying Roe v. Wade. When they're ready to get serious about the most pressing issues of facing this country, House Democrats stand ready to work with them to deliver. Until then, we're gonna continue to call out their extremism each and every step of the way. Our Vice Chair, Ted Lieu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Aguilar, and good morning. Uh, last week, the American people saw a clear contrast between a unified Democratic caucus working on behalf of the American people and the chaos, confusion, crisis of the Republican caucus who've been captured by MAGA extremists. And this contrast continues this week. So while Democrats are putting people over politics and working to lower costs and get better paying jobs and safer communities, what is the very first thing Republicans do? The very first bill they pass, it guts the Office of Government Ethics. Essentially, when you read what they say, you cannot hire any staff after 30 days for that important office, which means if any staff has to leave, relocate, resign, for whatever reason, leave the office, they cannot be replaced. So over time, this office could shrink to nothing. And why do Republicans want to do that? Well, they want to stop investigations into themselves. And we see that again with what's going to be voted on today, which is their committee to obstruct justice. They're going to create a committee to meddle into ongoing law enforcement investigations. Some of these investigations are investigating Republican members of Congress, as well as the former failed president. So that is what the American people are seeing, and that contrast will continue to play out week after week after week. And now it's my honor to introduce our terrific ranking member of appropriations, Rosa DeLauro. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be with all of you today, and I want to say a thank you to Chairman uh, Aguilar, Vice Chairman Liu, uh, for inviting me to join the press conference this morning, and also to thank uh, my colleagues, Chairman Neal and Chairman Boyle, uh, for their leadership. Uh, as my colleagues have mentioned, 
the Republicans' chaotic process to elect a Speaker of the House, it's unprecedented, uh, but, and it's also dangerous. Republicans are making side agreements, handshake deals that not only contradict their calls for transparency, but also attempt to short circuit the 2024 government funding process before um, uh, it, it even gets started. Appropriations bills are must-pass bills. They require bipartisan, bicameral agreement, like the House Democratic majority secured when we passed the agreement, um, uh, uh, and the funding the omnibus bill in December. It appears, quite honestly, that Republicans, they don't understand this process because in his attempt to become speaker, uh, Kevin McCarthy reportedly already promised to cap spending uh, at the 2022 levels in exchange for votes. Let me just take a second to tell you about uh, what that means. Now, obviously, we do not have the exact cuts that the speaker traded for votes because the deal was made in secret. Uh, but there's a discussion that the cut from 2023 would apply to all discretionary spending, defense and non-defense. That's at least a $130 billion cut to all discretionary spending. That's about an 8% cut. If you take it all from non-defense, it is at about a 17% cut. And while there are some House Republicans saying that they will not cut national, um, uh, national security, they would then leave veterans in the lurch. Taking the veterans programs back to 2022 would shortchange VA medical care by at least $31 billion. That's a 32% below what we just enacted in December. It doesn't account for potential increases the department will identify on their upcoming budget requests. So these are, they're gonna slash what are critical investments. Um, and as I said, it's defense, national security, military read readiness, and a combat capability. Uh, and again, I make reference to uh, service members and their families. Uh, the funds that they rely on, this is cuts to VA medical care, mental health services, the homeless assistance programs that ensure that we uh, 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 reach unhoused veterans. They will be making serious cuts to law enforcement. These spending cuts harm families, communities throughout the U.S. that are already struggling with inflation and the cost of living. It is not a, just a soundbite to say that people are living in this country today paycheck to paycheck. It is a reality. So the funding for high poverty schools, post-secondary education, early learning programs hang in the balance. Access to childcare, training programs are at risk. We will cut the benefits for small businesses. But I guess my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they consider that all of these services are unimportant, not to be taken into consideration because you know as well as I know that budgets are statements of values. And it tells you precisely where their values are or are not. In our bills, we provided 43.5 million people the SNAP benefits they need. This past year alone, our bills created over 21,500 affordable housing units. Progress made to help those in most need put food on their table, roof over their heads. All of that is jeopardized. Republicans have created an institution that governs in the shadows at the expense of hardworking families and a speaker who traded funding that helps communities, that protects our national security for personal gain. I hope this troubling, this dangerous trend is reversed soon and that transparency is restored to the government funding process. And with that, let me introduce to you the chair of the Ways and Means uh, Committee, Congressman Richard Nee. Thanks to the leadership team here for having us get out front on some of the issues that we're going to uh, confront in the course of the next few months. So even for those of you who had a chance to witness the debate last night and 
their first funding bill, uh, $114 billion it adds to the national deficit. And if you listen to the debate last night, I also thought what was compelling to the battle, they came unarmed. It was pretty remarkable to listen to the, the back and forth last night where we dealt with facts and uh, specificity, and they dealt uh, once again in generalities and kind of empty talk. What I also think is uh, noteworthy is we get to what eventually will be a vote on the debt ceiling. It's certainly putting the question in front of the American people. They voted for the CARES Act. <laughs> they voted for more money for national defense spending. Some of them voted for the infrastructure bill. And then they also voted for $5 trillion worth of tax cuts in 201, 203, and 2017. Although it comes out to about $4.7 trillion of tax cuts. And they, it, gets, it allows them, in this instance, after what they've done, to sort of set the fire and then call the fire department. So it's been kind of the recklessness that they've embraced in, in this fiscal debate and discussion. But it's going to bring us to the precipice because it'll allow us to have a full throttle debate over the role of Social Security and Medicare in our lives. I'm looking forward to that. It's really important to remember, as I've just described it, where the tax cuts were, where the spending increases came from, and then how we intend to defend Social Security and Medicare and do the responsible thing and raise the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling shouldn't be held hostage to this sort of conversation, particularly when you participated in increased spending, which, by the way, was all valid. All valid. The CARES Act. Speaker Pelosi and I, with Secretary Mnuchin, we negotiated that legislation in her office. Many of you were witness to it when you saw the final product and we came out of the Speaker's office at the time, with Secretary Mnuchin calling in back and forth over eight days. They all voted for it. And I call attention to that because now they want to say, well, we're not going to raise the debt ceiling until you agree to irresponsible cuts in domestic spending. Better to have the discussion right now. Let's set the table. Let's get to the debate over Social Security and Medicare. Happy to engage. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Richie. Uh, <laughs> want to overdo it. <laughs> so I'm uh, uh, Brendan Boyle, Brendan, not Brandon, uh, incoming ranking member of the Budget Committee. And actually, let me um, build off what Richie just said and focus on one area uh, as part of the adopted rules package last night, and that's cut go. You know, you can always tell when there's a Democrat in the White House because their Republican colleagues suddenly become concerned again about deficit and debt. When there's a Republican in the White House, they conveniently forget that topic. But every time they take over and there's a Democrat in the White House, suddenly there's this focus on deficit and debt. Well, here's the hypocrisy in what they're saying. As part of CutGo that they reinstated last night, any tax cuts that they propose do not have to be offset. So all of those critical investments that Chair DeLauro spoke about, critical investments in the American people, education, jobs creation, helping veterans, all of those have to be offset according to their rules. But another big round of tax cuts, like what they did the last time they were in the majority, $2 trillion tax cut, 83% of which went to the wealthiest 1%, not one dime of that would have to be offset. So keep that in mind when they are crying crocodile tears about our national debt. I would also say, as, as Chairman Neal did, the debt ceiling should not ever be something we play around with. It is too dangerous. This country has been able to get through and weather government shutdowns. We would not be able to weather a compromise on the full faith and credit of the United States. It would cripple not only the US economy, but the world economy. This caucus has the responsible position not to play politics with this. The other side has been threatening repeatedly as recently as last night to refuse to raise the debt ceiling because they're so hell bent on cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We won't let them get away with it. And now it's my pleasure to bring back our chairman, Pete Aguilar. Thanks, Brendan. Questions? Should the discovery of President Biden's classified documents be disclosed before the election? 
Well, let's let's step back and talk about this for a minute because, uh, and I, I appreciate the question. This is Republican hypocrisy at its finest. When the former president had 320 documents found at his personal residence, they said that, quote, that will not be a priority. What President Biden did was disclose this to the archives, let law enforcement know. That is exactly the way that you should handle this. So we're going to support the fact that the president is following this established protocol, that he did the right thing, um, and uh, see what other um, uh, and see where we go from here. But we're not interested. Republicans aren't interested in having meaningful oversight. They're just interested in opposing this president. What do you say to Go ahead. What do you say to critics who argue these documents were discovered November 2nd, midterms were November 8th, and they could have been withheld to avoid potential damage against Democrats if they were missing? This, this was done in consultation. You saw Merrick Garland have a U.S. attorney uh, weigh in at this point. Uh, this is being done the exact way, getting the archives involved. Uh, someone who was on the January 6th com committee, uh, there is a process to handling documents. The president is handling it the way he should. Uh, that's what's important here. Go ahead. I don't think that's a question for me. That might be a question directed down the down the street. But uh, what I, what I'll tell you is, this is being done. This is being handled the way he should. Be, uh, this is not this is not about August. This is about you know today. You know where we are at. Uh, the president is handling this the way the way that he uh, the way that he should. He's disclosing it. He's uh, letting the archives know. Uh, law enforcement is aware. We're handling this with the seriousness at which it deserves. Uh, but we're not downplaying this, uh, which is exactly what House Republicans have done. Did you have something? Richard? No, just to say the Justice Department has the issue. Uh, I'm going to yield to to Vice Chair Liu, who talked about um, the Republican Rules Package in the Office of Congressional Ethics. Kevin McCarthy owns George Santos, lock, stock, and barrel. If George Santos wasn't seated, what would the math have been for Speaker McCarthy? He would have had to flip another vote or get two people to vote present. I mean, this is he 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 owns George Santos. That's the only reason why he was seated is to give George Santos uh, that ability to vote for Kevin McCarthy. So let's 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 call this exactly what it is. Uh, there should be repercussions. Uh, the state and federal governments and the law enforcement agencies uh, should look into it. The FEC uh, should look into this. I know that there might be an ethics complaint that's filed uh, here as well. Uh, but this is an incredibly serious issue from someone who clearly is divorced from reality uh, and sanity. Um, but this is at the feet of, of Kevin McCarthy, not just George Santos alone. Vice Chair Liu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Aguilar. So the Republican Rules Package says that uh, you cannot hire any staff to the Office of Government Ethics after 30 days. Why would they do that? Like, you should ask, what is the rationale for doing that? Well, the rationale is to shrink this office, because if anyone leaves after 30 days, they don't get replaced. And eventually, there's going to be no one in that office because they don't want the office investigating people like George Santos. And as Chairman Aguilar noted, arguably George Santos was the deciding vote for Kevin McCarthy for speaker. It was also disclosed yesterday uh, that when George Santos was fundraising, uh, apparently his fundraising person was telling folks that he was actually Kevin McCarthy's chief of staff. So if they were using the telephones, which I assume they were, uh, that would essentially be conspiracy to commit wire fraud. So what George Santos did was not only unethical, it appears to be highly illegal. And you have ethical uh, investigations, but also you have what looks to me like criminal liability. 
I think Speaker McCarthy needs to talk about what he thinks about George Santos and really put him up uh, for a condemnation or an expulsion vote from this Congress. Just, just one last point on that. If, if George Santos wasn't seated, uh, I might be giving another nominating speech. And so, um, <laughs> you know, we could still be going at this. Uh, Garrett and then Leanne. Nobody wants that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, nine. You didn't like anything with one of the nine? Come on, Garrett. Um, there's a populating committee this week. Um, Speaker McCarthy's reiterated his uh, desire to not seat Adam Schiff or Eric Swalwell on the Select Committee on Intel, should their names be put forward. Is it the caucus's intention to put their names forward to be seated on that committee? And what happens if uh, Speaker McCarthy follows through on that threat and, and strikes them from uh, the Intel Committee? That's a steering for uh, Leader Jeffries as well as a steering and policy committee. So steering and policy will, will meet once we have the ratios. Uh, in negotiation with uh, the majority, uh, we'll have those ratios. We will populate our committees and we will send the names of the individuals who this caucus supports uh, and are qualified to serve on committees. What the speaker does beyond that is something that we will handle, and I know you have a bunch of hypotheticals for me, but it isn't anything that we're going to get into today. So the, the, the process... The, pro the, the, process, the process is that the caucus will advance uh, the nominees uh, and the individuals who we feel best reflect a democratic caucus, our democratic values, uh, and uh, uh, have the ability uh, to lead, uh, including uh, ranking membership. And so uh, they will be put forward. What the speaker does beyond that is something that, uh, that the leadership team and the steering and policy committee uh, will have to handle. Leanne? There, there is a process we call that the tinfoil hat committee um, uh, in our in our caucus. Um, there is a process by which members will raise their hands and let leadership know uh, what they are interested in. Uh, it is our intent to seat members on uh, every subcommittee, every select committee, every subcommittee uh, that the leadership uh, on the majority side advances. It's in our best interest to make sure we are representing the will of the caucus and the American public and that Republicans don't have an opportunity behind closed doors uh, to shape and to add to these conspiracy theories. Uh, that is not in the interest of the American public. And by the way, none of these issues that they are advancing have anything to do with lowering costs that Americans are facing. This is all about campaign promises and a secret three-page document that none of us have seen uh, that was the path for Kevin McCarthy to become speaker. And so we're going to continue to do the business of the people each and every step of the way. Let's go over here. Well, I, I, I think that my, my point is is that you cannot pass uh, appropriations bills without them being both bipartisan and bicameral. So uh, and the president will not sign. So I, I, I think this notion that um, you can deal with 2022 levels uh, that appears to have been part of this uh, secret deal uh, that you then may be looking at guaranteeing uh, a, uh, a shutdown. We will operate uh, in the way that we have, bill by bill, with the issues that are important to us. I intend to, I, you don't want to work. I, I, I think it's very interesting to note that in a divided government, last December, you may recall, we passed an omnibus bill, a bipartisan omnibus bill. Nine Republican votes in the House, and I think close to 19, somewhere around that, in the Senate. So we were able to govern. The issue is going to be is whether or not the Republican majority can govern. But we are going to, uh, as I say, we will 
work together, we will cooperate, but we are not backing off the critical investments that have been made that will continue to be made because someone traded away the well-being of the American public and our national security for personal gain for a vote. No way to run a government and no way to govern. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, Chairman Neal and, and Ranking Member Boyle uh, as well to, to comment on this because I think it is so important that we do talk about what that document is laying the groundwork. It's laying the groundwork toward dysfunction, default, and potential government shutdowns that none of us want. Ranking Member Neal. Sure. Thanks, Pete. Just one quick uh, observation for those of you who have some institutional memory here. You really believe that Republicans are going to embrace a government shutdown? How have the politics of that situation worked out for them in the past, dating back to Clinton Gingrich? If there's one thing that the people that have been on that side for a long time remember, they have lost every showdown over shutting down the government. Believe me, they are not going to shut down the government for sure. Look, we all know in the end what this is about. When Social Security was created in the 1930s, Republicans opposed it. They have opposed it in every generation since. Um, as recently as uh, late 2004, when George W. Bush was reelected, if you remember his first press conference the day after the election, he said, I have political capital, and I intend to use it. And what was his number one priority? To privatize part of Social Security. Now here we are, and don't take my word for it, just read the press statements of Kevin McCarthy a couple months ago. Um, every single one of the Republicans who was running to be my counterpart on budget committee as chair, they were all saying they intend to use the debt ceiling as leverage to win cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. To their credit, they're being public about it. Now, I've worked on this issue my entire time here in Congress, working to attempt to depoliticize this uh, bomb to our economy and the worldwide economy. I'm so proud of this caucus, not just House Democrats, but working with the White House as well. We are firmly united on this. And just as Republicans lost back in the Gingrich Congress in the mid-1990s, just as they lost in 2011 on this issue, they will lose again in 2023. Last I just want to make one point. You know, I, I think you all will recall last uh, d December, I was, you know, uh, swarmed with uh, so many of you are in this audience today. I mean, it just is, you know, just overwhelming. Are we going to shut the government down? Are we going to shut the government down? This is going to lead to a government shutdown. And just absolute no, we are not going to have a government shutdown. Why? Because there was a willingness to work together with our colleagues in the House and our colleagues in the Senate, in the Senate, in order to be able to fashion public policy that was going to be beneficial to the American people, whether it was their national security, which was their jobs, job training, whether it was veterans, and we came to an agreement. That is singularly the issue of ability to govern. As the chairman said of Ways and Means, that they won't shut it down, but we will wait to see what their process is going to be. We know what our process is going to be and how we're going to continue to move at keeping government moving forward. Yes. Last question. Yes, sir. I'll let Ranking Member Neal speak, but this, uh, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is just fanciful, it, it, the depths at which they'll go. Um, and, we can, and we can talk about exactly what these uh, dollars, what the financial uh, benefit is to the taxpayers to collect uh, these tax receipts. Um, this is about making sure that everybody pays their fair share. Uh, and that the richest don't get to avoid time and time again 
uh, the ability to do that. I'll let Mr. Neal talk, talk a little bit about um, that proposal. Yeah, just the facts of the issue. So Charles Rosati, who's uh, lettered to me two years ago, a uh, uh, former IRS commissioner under Bill Clinton, he said there's $574 billion annually that goes uncollected. And Charles Reddick, the IRS commissioner, a Republican under Donald Trump, said that number is closer to a trillion dollars annually that goes uncollected. Now, what we voted for last night, or voted against last night, was to remain consistent to our position, and that was computer modeling, replacing retired IRS officials, which have been cut by 30% over the last 15 years. We addressed that. And enhanced technology. For those of you who are stuck at airports with Southwest, the one thing you should be reminded about, now the evidence points to technology and the lack of its sufficient upgrade that created the chaos. That's what happens with the IRS. Every year for our local school systems, 200 teachers retire, you replace them. They haven't done that at the IRS. So don't go by what I have to say about this. Charles Rosati, Democrat. Charles Reddick, a Republican. $574 billion. Think of what you could do with that. $574 billion a year that goes uncollected. And back to Commissioner Reddick, who said a trillion dollars a year goes uncollected. That's the tax gap. Thank you.